For the second episode of my Godzilla Grand Prix, where I'm doing three different Godzilla videos, three Fridays in a row, I decided to go back to one of my favorite series on this channel, turning Godzilla monsters into dragons. Even though lots of them, you know, basically already are dragons, it's still a fun series. And a bunch of other art channels that do story and speed paint style videos wanted to do Godzilla videos today as well, so we turned it into a sort of collaboration. In the pinned comment and description, I've got links to videos going out from Dempsey J Illustrations, Kingpin Creations, Knight of Arcane, and Nerd Comics Inc., in all of which I cameo as different Multiverse Tales Popcross Studios characters, and use those characters to give them each a different kind of Godzilla to work with in their videos. And I think I wrote some pretty funny stuff for those cameos. So make sure to check those out too. I'll I'll mention them again at the end, but for now, into some more Godzilla Dragons. Let's go! Hit like, if you want, subscribe, if you feel like, but either way, enjoy the show. More and more ancient dragons of legend have been reappearing in my world. The reason for this is still unknown to me, but stranger still is that even the ones told in old tales to be violent and dangerous have been fairly docile towards humans for the most part, that is. One that I came across recently was a male of the species called the Jinshin Mutaurus. These are not quite the same as some of the others to reawaken, as they were known to be a full species in days of old, albeit a very rare species to find, and one that had legendary clashes with the likes of the savior dragon of Japan, Gojiralith. These creatures did have the capacity to reproduce in large numbers, but it is said that any time a female laid a nest of eggs, Gojiralith would hunt down the nest and destroy it before the brood could hatch. The tales say it did this to protect the people of Japan from being overrun and wiped out by these creatures. But given how territorial Gojiralith was known to be, it would also not surprise me to learn that it simply did this to keep an invasive species of new dragons from spreading in its home territory. What I consider to be one of the most interesting things about the Mutaurus species, though, is the difference between the males and the females. The males of this species are smaller, reaching about 36 feet in height, but they also have wings and the ability to fly. The females, on the other hand, do not have wings. They are in fact classified better as drakes, and their full-grown height is generally considered to have been around 50 feet making them larger than the males, with some other legends stating that they could evolve into an even larger and more lethal state beyond that. They also had the power to emit a concussive disorientation pulse from their mouths, in place of a flame or other type of breath attacks common amongst dragons. This pulse would make any human or most creatures impacted by it dizzy and confused for a few minutes, often giving the Mutaurus plenty of time to approach and slay their next meal. Thus far, I have only seen a male emerge, but if a female does rear its head in the modern day as well, tracking it to a potential new nest may be useful in discovering if the great dragon Gojiralith has also awakened. Now, I'll be honest, I kind of flip-flopped a bunch with this episode in terms of how I thought it turned out, but this drawing was actually the last drawing that I did for the episode, and I was like, okay, I really have to crush it with this one because I need to have one drawing that I really love in this episode. And funny enough, doing this one and it turning out pretty well helped me go, okay, wait, actually, the other drawings in this episode are actually pretty cool too. And now I stepped away from it for a little bit and came back again, and now I look at all the drawings and I'm like, I think this drawing is only my third favorite, so I actually do really like a bunch of the stuff in this episode, and I, I think this one turns out pretty cool. I probably could have leaned more into a dragon aesthetic. I mean, this almost looks like it could just be my take on Muto, but I mean, that's just a recurring thing in this series because I'm turning a lot of characters that are basically already dragons into dragons. A lot of these don't have tons of change-ups besides them just being in my art style. Also, just to point out, I do know that the two reference images that I used, I'm pretty sure both of them were of the female Muto, and the drawing I did is of the male Muto, which you may have guessed from the lore because it has wings. But surprisingly, there weren't a ton of good reference images that I could use as, like, big images to have on screen as my reference for this. A lot of the footage of the Mutos is very dark and obscured, so I just took what I could get with those reference images. But yeah, overall, I'm super happy with this one, but I, now looking back, I'm like, I think the next two drawings are even better. But let's see how this one finished up.
Now the last time I was learning about these mythic dragons, a group I've worked with on various occasions called the Slayers of Cursed Predators informed me that the protector dragon Gojirolith was a descendant of an even more powerful and lethal dragon called Gojirone, who was not a savior of the people but a malicious slaughterer of them. Eventually it was believed to have been killed for good in a collective effort by the people of Japan, but many also feared that it could regenerate and come back to life and cause destruction once again. So, a clan of ancient sorcerers decided to try and make a deterrent. A group referring to themselves as the Apex Warlocks took a broken piece of one of Gojirone's dorsal fins and spent months channeling the most powerful magic they could muster into it to try and create a dragon of equal power that they could control. This was a similar endeavor to what would be taken on many years later by a more greedy group called the Nebulous Knights of M when they created the beast known as Gigantua. But while that creature was a homunculus blend of many creatures, the beast that the Apex Warlords made heavily resembled Gojirone, but with a silver hide and lifeless crimson eyes. When it did finally stir to life, it seemed at first to be exactly what the Warlocks had hoped for. It would obliterate any dragon that threatened the people of their kingdom. But the more it fought and the more it destroyed, the more it seemed eager to cause destruction. The beast eventually seemed to take on the very demeanor of the monster that it had been spawned from, and began causing just as much devastation as Gojirone had. While nothing is certain about how it was finally defeated, some say that when all hope seemed lost, Japan saw the very first emergence of Gojirolith, descended from Gojirone but a savior to the people. It's said that other weaker dragons of Japan rallied with it to aid it in defeating this man-made armored Gojirone monster. On top of that, it's said that to this day still, the most expensive armors one can find in Japan are made from the very hide of this ancient beast. And while the odds of this admittedly seem quite slim, it wouldn't surprise me in the least to learn that someone I know has ancestors who made some of these very rare armors. Now with Mechagodzilla here, I did actually consider making it an actual mechanical dragon and figuring out some way to fit that in with the lore. I mean, in this same universe, we have my Godzilla monsters as Transformers episodes, so I probably could have tied it in with that somehow if I wanted to. But I, I doing this drawing made me think back to the second ever episode of this series, which was Avengers Villains as Dragons, where I did Ultron as a sort of albino version of my Iron Man dragon. And neither of those were mechanical, and I was like, I, I think I want to go with this sort of route instead, and I am happy with that. A mech dragon probably also would have taken significantly more time, and this drawing already took like five hours. But the other main thing that I wanted to do with this one is what I sort of felt like I failed to do with my Godzilla minus one dragon drawing from the last episode. I mean, I, I love how that drawing turned out, and I probably still like that drawing better than this one, but I mentioned in that drawing that I wanted him to have a really impactful atomic breath uh, image where like you could really feel the oomph of it. And the only thing that made it fail in that regard is that the Godzilla minus one dragon's pose was a little bit too swoopy. So it didn't feel like the beam was actually an intense beam that was blowing his body back a little bit. And so the things I said in that is I would have wanted to have him standing on the ground, bracing himself better, head leaned forward and wings up to kind of brace him more. So I did all of that in this drawing with our Mecha Godzilla version. And funny enough, I still think the other one has a little bit more impact to it, a bit more punch, but I do think pose wise this works better and makes it look like the beam is more of a more of a massive force being shot out of this dragon. So again, think I still like the Godzilla minus one dragon a bit better, but I'm very happy that I pulled off the pose and and combo of the pose and atomic breath or whatever Mecha Godzilla's version of atomic breath is called in this drawing. Another of the dragons I've spotted roaming my world, once thought to be myth, is the Angulus Spike Spine. It's a 40 foot tall wyvern with a hide so durable it's said that only Gojirolith, or a beast of near equal might, could penetrate it. This creature's legends have it stated as both a friend and foe to Gojirolith. 
The first time it came into the Savior Dragon's territory, they clashed, and the Spike Spine nearly lost its life, with Gojiralith practically biting clean through its neck. But later tales claim that it aided Gojiralith, and even assisted the Aptilian King, another friend and foe of the Savior of Japan, in defeating other vicious threats to Japan and the world. This creature has heavily armored plating running down its back. That armor is also covered in spikes, and is the creature's main shield and weapon. It will launch itself backwards at foes with the intent to impale them on its spikes, something that would be lethal to most normal creatures it came up against. That was far from its only method of attack, though. It also had, or should I say has, given the fact that it has returned, very sharp teeth and a forceful bite, along with a sonic blast that it can project from its mouth that has enough force to flatten any trees within 50 feet of it. It is also said that this creature can burrow underground surprisingly quickly to attack prey from below, or simply to warm itself in the dirt, but this is something I've yet to observe it doing since it reawakened. A part of me is intrigued by the possibility of seeing this creature in combat with another of equal strength. But I must be careful what I wish for, as one of the creatures that has awakened has me concerned about the risks of others like it lurking out from the darker depths of my world's past. The time finally came for me to use my favorite, or maybe second favorite, Godzilla monster and turn it into a dragon. My, uh, I kind of flip-flop nowadays between either Anguirus and Destroya being my favorite Godzilla monsters, but it's probably still Anguirus. And something I knew I had to do for this drawing is approach the pose differently, because very rarely on a drawing or of a creature, dragon, whatever, am I trying to emphasize the back of the creature. But with Anguirus, the most interesting thing about him, design-wise, is his back. He's got a really spiky turtle back that I think in some cases actually can sort of split off into wings, so I don't know if he ever has really used that in any significant way. I think he uses it in his first appearance. I don't totally remember, but anyway, so I thought about putting more spikes on the wings, but I think I like the balance that I ended up going with here, and this pose isn't one I've really used before. I was actually kind of pulling inspiration from my Nido King Godzilla drawing from Pokemon as Godzilla Monsters Part 1, because I was like, I think that's the most back I've shown of any creature in a drawing. And that, that might not even necessarily be true, but with this, I kind of emphasized it even more that I'm having him kind of swooping up, flying into the air. His wings are flared out so we can get a good look at both of those, and his back is kind of the main thing in the image, but also kind of rounds us up to his head. And then sort of last minute as I was rendering his head, I also added Anguirus's shriek, because he has like a, a shriek sort of attack. And I think it looks exactly like how it looks in, uh, I forget which video game it was, but the first Godzilla video game I ever played back on original Xbox that first introduced me to Anguirus. So that was a nice little addition that I hadn't planned that I think looks pretty cool. And so I think this pose works well. I, I think it makes it maybe my favorite drawing of the episode, even though he's a simpler looking dragon, just because it's something new and different pose-wise for me. And of course, you know, he's my favorite Godzilla monster. But I had also not planned on making this guy a wyvern, even though I've said many times that's my favorite kind of dragon. But once I drew his wings in, I realized that if he does have another set of arms, they'd be so obscured that we wouldn't be able to see them anyway. So there's no point in drawing them in there. So I just went, ah, whatever, canonically making this guy a wyvern. And I hope you all like this one as much as I do. Let's take a look. Oh, by the way, all of these will be up as posters on my Teespring store. I'm not going to do the, like, mid-video ad break thing. The, if you want them, the posters will be linked in the description. Quick heads up before we get into the lore, I did this drawing twice, and I like the second one much more, but I'm showing both of them in here. And also, I wrote the lore for the Scar King before I saw the movie last night, because I wanted to make sure there were no spoilers for anyone that didn't get to see it when this video came out. Okay, now off to Taryn with the lore. As I mentioned previously, most of the creatures to emerge have been docile towards humans, but there is an exception. One of the creatures to come forth may have some scattered mentions in the legends of Gojiralith and the Aptilian King, but it seems certain that it is of the same species as the King, and may not approve of the fact that that beast holds such a name. You see, this beast, 
which I now refer to as the Aptilian Whipslash, appears much like an orange-furred version of the Aptilian, and began slaughtering the most powerful dragons and beasts in the territory near where the Aptilian King had last been seen. It seems clear now that it was attempting to lure out the Aptilian King for a battle, and in spite of the legendary strength and cunning of the King, the Whipslash apparently had the upper hand for much of this fight. It is leaner, faster, has longer wings, and, most notably, it has a bony whip-like tail, at the end of which is a glowing blue blade. It was able to maneuver this appendage with astounding accuracy, and practically cut the Aptilian to pieces with it, causing major damage to the king's arm. The Aptilian king apparently wound up retreating from this fight, but I doubt the Whipslash will allow it to flee for long, as this new monstrosity seems as though it is out to kill the king making that very title essentially its for the taking. Though I do wonder and hope if the Aptilian King did deem it necessary to retreat from this fight, is there a chance it will now seek out its old ally and show my world that once again Gojuralith has arisen to help the King defeat this new threat? Alright, so this was one of those rare cases where I disliked a drawing enough that I felt I had to redo it. And that the, the reason I was a little bit down on this video was because the first drawing I did was the Scar King as a dragon, and I just didn't like how this version turned out. I mean, I'll, here's the finished version of the first drawing, and it's like, it's serviceable, like it's okay, but I was like, first of all, it doesn't look enough like a dragon to me. I don't like the shape of the wings, I don't like the pose. I wanted it to kind of work as a companion piece to my Kong dragon drawing, but uh, but then I ended up setting it at night, and I just, it, it, so many things about it, I was just like, this is really putting a damper on the episode for me, and I, last night, as I was, you know, it, usually I have my videos done at least two days in advance, and this one I'm finishing it the morning that it's coming out, and I was like, okay, if I'm really considering redoing this drawing, I should keep in mind that one, it's not likely to make the video do that much better, and two, it's going to put me behind on working on Monday's video, The Death of Benny Sharp, and that means I'm going to have to do work this weekend. With those things in mind, is it still worth it for me to take another four hours to do a new version of this drawing? And I still went a resounding yes. I really wanted to do a really good version of the Scar King, especially after I saw the movie last night. So I was like, all right, let's do this. Let's redo it. And I'm so glad I did. I like the shape of the head so much more. I like the pose so much more. I made the background completely set as a pairing for the Kong dragon so that if someone, I mean, originally that Kong dragon was paired with a Godzilla dragon on the other side. But now if someone wanted to have Godzilla, or wanted to have Kong and Scar King as their pairing, you could do that instead. And I also said going into this one, okay, my favorite drawing from this episode is probably Anguirus so far, and that was the simplest design, and my Kong dragon is one of my simplest dragons of the last few years as well, and it's also one of my favorites. So let's not go over the top with this. And let's also fix the bones on the tail, because I thought they looked janky and weird. The shape I went with was just kind of bleh in the last one. In this one, I, I still went kind of more simple than a bone tail actually would be, but I think this works a lot better. And overall, just... The pose on this one, like I said, the head, everything about this one, I really like better than the first version. And I hope you're all jazzed about it as well, so let's take a look. I hope you all enjoyed round four of Godzilla Dragons, but if you want a bunch more Godzilla stuff, remember to check out the videos from Dempsey J Illustrations, Nerd Comics Inc., Knight of Arcane, Kingpin Creations. All of those are linked in the description, and unlike with the Pal World collaboration I did with this group a few weeks back where most of us did the same sort of thing, this time everyone did something different with Godzilla monsters, turning them into different stuff. And again, a cameo in all those videos. So go check them out if you like what you see, subscribe to them, like their videos, comment, all that good engagement stuff. Or if you want some more Godzilla dragons out of me, I've got three other videos on that on this channel. And I'll have another Godzilla video coming out a week from today. But besides that, that's all for today, except of course for ending this video on some kind of positive or inspiring note. And the thought I want to leave people with today is a quote I heard this week from a man named Kenny Smith. I mean, I heard it from Inky Johnson, but Inky Johnson said that Kenny Smith 
said this. But the quote is that champions do daily what everyone else only does occasionally. So are there habits that you do only when you're feeling really motivated and inspired that if you started doing every single day, you could achieve miraculous things? Probably. So maybe take a think about what those things are and if you can discipline yourself to do them every day. I hope that's inspiring. I love you all and I'll see you all in the next video on Monday. The April 1st video, The Death of Benny Sharp, which has got to be one of the funniest scripts I've ever written.